it will make me full of gladness with your presence. Fellow Israelites, I may say to you confidently of our ancestor David that he both died and was buried, and his tomb is with us to this day. Since he was a prophet, he knew that God had sworn with an oath to him that he would put one of his descendants on his throne. Foreseeing this, David spoke of the resurrection of the Messiah, saying he was not abandoned to Sheol, nor did his flesh experience corruption. This Jesus God raised up, and of that all of us are witnesses. reading today is from the Gospel of John. It's the 20th chapter, verses 19 to 31. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. If you retain the sins of any, they are retained. But Thomas, who was called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the mark of nails on his hands and put my finger in the mark of the nails and my hand in his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were again in the house, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were shut, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Do not doubt, but to believe. Thomas answered him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Have you believed because you have seen me? Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have come to believe. Now, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing in him, you may have life in his name. May we hear and understand what the scriptures are teaching us today. Let us pray. Blessed are you, O God of our Lord Jesus Christ, in whom we receive the legacy of a living hope, born again not only from his death, but also from his resurrection. May we who have received forgiveness of sins through the Holy Spirit live to set others free until at length we enter the inheritance that is imperishable and unfading, where Christ lives and reigns with you and the same Spirit. Amen. So a few things to think about. I know you've heard me talk about this before if you've been here. What makes Christians hide? What makes Christians not admit that they're Christians? What makes us as followers of Jesus hide out today? How many of us at work or with friends at the club 
or at the grocery store will admit to being Christians? Are we afraid of being persecuted like they were? Or are we afraid of being associated with a movement that calls itself Christian? Good questions, I think. What would you have done if you were Thomas? I'm probably going to have to break down and replace these batteries, but we'll see. What would you have done if you were Thomas? Remember, Jesus appeared to the disciples in the room, and they all saw him, and they all saw the wounds. It's just that Thomas wasn't there. So would you have trusted your friends when they say, I've seen Jesus, I have experienced that resurrection. Would you trust them? Or would you say, oh yeah, sure. I need to see Jesus for myself before I'm going to believe. So, you know, give Thomas a little break. Do you think that seeing is better than hearing for a life of faith? Do you think that just because somebody else tells you you should believe? Or do you think you've got to see it for yourself? Bertrand Russell would have said, I've got to see it and touch it and feel it and hear it and smell it all for myself. I can't trust anybody else. And, again, the same question as last week. Remember who ran from the tomb and told everybody? Mary, right? Why was a woman entrusted with news of the resurrection if the men struggled to believe her? I'm going to try my other one. We'll see. If I were you, I wouldn't want to listen to all that crackling. Locked doors, 
sometimes don't keep things out. The locked doors could not keep Jesus away from his disciples. There are other scriptures that tell us height, depth, mountains, rivers, walls, nothing is going to keep the love of God from us. Just so with his disciples. And what were his first words? Was he mad that they were chicken and hiding? Why don't you stand up for me? No. His first words? Peace be with you. No fear, no scolding, no turmoil, no doubt, only peace. These are words that often Christians say to each other, peace be with you. And in the Gospel of John, right now, at this very moment, Jesus not only gives them peace, but he does something else. He breathed the gift of the Holy Spirit into the disciples. He commissioned them to go out and to be the church, to be peace, to be love, to be justice for the world. And just as God sent Jesus, Jesus says, now I send you. Here is my breath of life, my very being, my spirit. In this particular breath, for me, and I think maybe for you if I remind you, you can hear an echo of Genesis, where God's breathing life into the creatures at the beginning of the world. On Easter, in effect, God recreates through resurrection not just a few followers of long ago, but all of us. Now, I have something I'd like you to join me in before we continue our talk. There's a beautiful song called Let It Breathe On Me. These are the words. Some of you will recognize it. We've sung it often here. And if you're really curious about the music notes, you can look at 288 in the hymnal. So, Sandy, help me out here. Eugene Peterson's translation, who I look at often, 
of, in the message of Jesus' words here provides a different way of looking at this. He says, if you forgive someone's sins, they're gone for good. If you don't forgive sins, what are you going to do with them? I think it's a great question. It's clearly not a direct translation. But he says, if, if you can't forgive someone, you're going to be holding on to that forever. I read memes that say, forgive them. Not for them, but for you. For your own spiritual and mental health. It reminds us that the Spirit and the resurrection are gifts given to us so that we can share them with the world and become part of God's transformation of this world that God loves so much. Yes, faith is personal and private. But in addition, Jesus intends for us to share that faith with the world, with the universe. He wants a spirit-filled church to be his gift to the world. Once again, we hear about this importance of seeing. We, we know that Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed, that Peter and the other disciples ran a race, they saw the linen wrappings lying there. They went and saw and believed. They saw and believed. All of these say that. Mary Magdalene saw the two angels in white and then saw Jesus standing there and didn't even recognize him until he asked her, who are you looking for? Mary. And then she knows that it's Jesus. So this evening, the disciples see Jesus, his body, wounds and all. They see everything. They know it's him, but Thomas is late and doesn't see everything. And, you know, it's kind of reasonable to say, well, you know, okay, you say you saw it, but I can't believe it for myself until I see it too. He sounds kind of modern, sort of empirical, you know. He wants to put his own finger in the wound, too. I looked at some of those paintings and I just went, ooh! <laughs> you know? and, but, you know, he wants to experience that resurrection on his own personal basis, and I really can't blame him too much. I think we've been a little too judgmental of doubting Thomas. Because when he sees, when he touches, just like all the other disciples got to do the week before, he believes. My Lord and my God, he knows he has encountered the presence of God. Every year, a week after Easter, we give Thomas a hard time. Every single year, this particular Sunday, is about Thomas. And every year, all of us that talk about Thomas try to put another spin on it, somehow so that I don't bore you with last year's sermon about Thomas. But I tell you, Jesus says how blessed we are that we don't see, not in the flesh, and yet we believe and we hear. But there is a deeper experience than just looking at someone standing in front of you. There is that whole experience of the spirit and the breath of God there are many people who, just like Thomas, they listen to us, at least I hope for many of us, that are all excited. It's Easter. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. And they're going, what are you talking about? How could that possibly be? I can't believe that unless I see some scientific evidence. Of course, science is kind of on the outs right now. But anyway. Unless I see some scientific evidence, I'm not going to believe it. But God teaches us how much we are blessed. Here's the trick. Our generation and generations before us, it's been a couple thousand years, we are asked to hear and believe. But there's something else. And I know, I know many of you personally, I know that you have experienced that spirit of God. And that direct 
personal experience in your soul and your mind is much more than what our eyes can see. In a lot of ways, we are the risen Christ. We are the thing that needs to come out of hiding and show ourselves to the world. We are the people, we are the Christians, we are the disciples, we are those following the way. And we gotta come out of that closet. We gotta claim our discipleship and our life. And we gotta breathe that breath that God breathed into all of creation in Genesis, and that Jesus breathed into his disciples, and we are the disciples. Those 12, or I guess maybe 11, since Thomas wasn't there that night, they cowered in fear behind locked doors when good news was waiting for them on the outside. Now, a lot of us complain, I'm among them, I complain that there's somebody who calls himself a Christian, and yet that person is full of hate and bigotry. And yet that person excludes other people. And yet that person actively engages in hurting people. They call themselves a Christian. And I don't get it. I don't know about you, but I'm not that kind of Christian. That's not me. I don't think that's you. But how can we change it? How can we change that impression among so many frightened, disenfranchised, hurting people? We can change it by coming out and being Christians and claiming our heritage as disciples and followers of that way and doing and being the church, doing all of these things that we are called to do. I think Christians have been given a bad name by immoral, judgmental people who want to use that title in order to gain power. In, let's see, I think I was about 13, 14, and I was going to a lot of Bible studies. Many of them were run by some very theologically conservative groups. Um, uh, and a lot of them did a lot of studies on the second coming. And they talked about the Antichrist. Now at the time, I was watching all the earthquakes and the wars and rumors of wars and all of that, and I thought, oh, it's gonna be next week. Now I know God is here. God is here and now. I don't know if there's gonna be a, a big physical giant apocalypse. And you know what? I'm not worried about it because I am a follower of God. I am a Christian. But here's the thing. We still have to watch out for those false prophets and those false teachers. And yes, those antichrists out there who claim to be followers of God and prophets and those who tell us, oh, it's God's will that all these people in Orlando die. No, that's not Christian. What is Christian? The breath of God, the love of God, those two big, big commandments. Love God with all your heart and love and your neighbor as yourself. You know, years ago, we had some modern prophets like Martin Luther King and Bishop Oscar Romero. And if you don't know who they are, that's okay, I think you'll find out. And maybe today, Pope Francis might be person who gives us the word of God very often. Uh, I have been impressed by the probe. And there's another person that I've been impressed with, and that's the Reverend William Barber of the United Church of Christ. 
He is the president of North Carolina NAACP. He's the architect of what's called the Moral Monday Movement. And he's given some stirring, stirring speeches. He spoke at the Democratic Convention. And he's speaking at the General Synod of the UCC in Maryland at the end of June. Um, he's a keynote speaker there. Something happened over the weekend that I read about with Reverend Barber, and it impressed me because it teaches us. And shortly after that, I'm going to leave you with the thoughts of what kind of witness that was and how we can be witnesses in the world for Christ. And I won't read you his whole letter. But what happened was, he had been a keynote speaker at a national interfaith movement. It was a, had been launched at uh, ecumenical advocacy days. And he preached a sermon. Uh, there, had, there was a multiracial crowd. They had a lot of wonderful singing. And afterwards, he went to Reagan National Airport to board an American Airlines plane to go to Raleigh, Durham and get in at about 10. Because he, he's headquartered in North Carolina. He is a very large guy. He's a lot bigger than me, so you know that's large. He also suffers from a bone fusion arthritic disability. That's part of the reason that he's so large, right? He can't exercise as much as he'd like. Because of this, he buys two seats for the airline. He does that because he can't fit in one seat, and he doesn't want to be putting people out. He's, he's trying to do the right thing. So he, he buys the two seats. He gets on the plane. The airline employees are very, forced, very gracious to him. Uh, he moves himself around to the most possible most comfortable possible position. And behind him, in a seat, there was a, a man who was talking really loudly. Really just, I don't know if you've ever been on fairly small planes, but when someone is right behind you speaking really loudly, it's terrible. Anyway, because of Reverend Barber's disability, he couldn't turn around to see um, you know, what happened. And he asked the stewardess, would you ask him to kind of tone it down? And she did. But as she left, he heard the guy saying, and he says in his letter about this, distasteful and disparaging things about me. He had problems with those people. And he spoke harshly about my need for two seats, among other subjects. As I heard these things, and I'm reading his letter now, I became more and more uncomfortable, especially since he was behind me. The attitude with which he spoke and my experiences with others who have directed similar harsh, sometimes threatening words, emails, and calls at me came to my mind. Because he was behind me, he made the comments, and because of my disability, the only way I could see him when I tried to speak to him as one human being to another was to stand and turn around. I asked him why he was saying such things, and, he, and I said, you don't know me, my condition. And I added that I would pray for him. This took place before the crew were giving the safety instructions. Reverend Barber says, I do not know who made the decision, but a plane official apparently called the police who came to my seat and said, sir, you need to leave the plane. I know you all heard about the fiasco with United. Reverend Barber says, I left. The American Airlines team at the desk was very gracious. Many said they were concerned, and some said they did not agree with the decision. I told each of them that I was okay. They found room on a flight leaving on Saturday morning. I returned to the hotel where I keynoted the event earlier in the evening. This morning, American staff graciously helped me reboard for the flight to Raleigh, Durham. Virtually all the police officers and American employees were gracious to me. Some were openly troubled by the decision to force me to spend another night away from home. To those of you who were worried about me, I am fine physically. Yes, I am not at all happy about what I believe were the real reasons I was the one asked to leave. My training and experiences with nonviolent civil disobedience and my deep faith, however, made my decision to peacefully comply with the order to get off the plane an easy one. I turned the matter over to my legal counselors, one here and one in Washington, D.C. The moral fusion movement must focus our attention on weightier matters. The struggle against the hatred and the fear take priority over matters of my comfort and convenience. I merely wanted to be treated fairly. 
want to emphasize, virtually all who had to implement the decision to remove me from the plane were embarrassed and upset by it. I thank them and I thank all my friends for the words of comfort and love and your prayers. Now let's get back to work, changing attitudes, stereotypes, perceptions, policies, and dealing with people's fear and hatred. Yours in faith, Reverend William J. Barber II. What I didn't tell you is that not only is he huge, he's black. So who knows what all the reasons were? But I have to tell you, he's a better man than I uh, that can handle that. There's so much graciousness. I think that Reverend Barber is probably one of the prophets of our generation. And yet, in today's passage from the Gospel of John, we hear the words, receive the Holy Spirit. For me, those words reassure us that God has given us, each and every one of us in every age, the Holy Spirit, has commissioned us and empowered us to be like Martin Luther King, Oscar Romero, Desmond Tutu, Bishop Francis, or Pope Francis, and Reverend Barber. We are each a holy and brilliant flame, each in our own way. We can be breathing love and peace and justice in the midst of fear and pain and hopelessness. So wherever and whenever we are afraid and hiding out all locked up, God comes to us in the midst of our fears and he says, peace be with you. Whatever doubts churn in our minds, whatever sins trouble our consciousness, Whatever pain and worry binds us up, and whatever walls we have put up, or doors we have locked, God comes and says, Peace be with you. Whatever hunger and need we feel deep in our souls, God calls us to the table, feeds us well, and sends us out into the world to be the church, to be justice and peace, to be salt and light, to be hope for the world. We can do it if we keep our eyes open, our minds limber, and our hearts soft and willing to love. As God sent Jesus, God sends us. This day, it's true. Amen. While Sandy gets up there to the piano, Go ahead and read this. Be the church. Some things we could do. Be the church. Protect the environment. Care for the poor. Forgive often. Reject racism. Fight for the powerless. Share earthly and spiritual resources. Embrace diversity. Love God. Enjoy this life. May it be so.